Hey everybody, welcome back after a couple of weeks off to Markets for Millennials to our weekly market analysis from July 11th to July 15th. And we'll start off here looking at the DXY. Now a lot of things have transpired uh, over the last few weeks, um, but one thing that has remained constant uh, since the time that I've been away um, is the dollar has been up. And um, so um, we see here the DXY uh, uh, punched one above 109 uh, on Thursday this week on the 14th. Um, uh, what was really interesting was uh, when you look at July 13th, and then we go to a one hour chart, and this will uh, look a lot better here. Um, on the 13th, right here in the center, um, right as the uh, CPI was released in that first hour, you saw the DXY uh, just in that one hour drop down. 0.7 percent um, and a lot of people were very interested in the fact that on a high cpi print the dollar was the dollar index was down and if you actually go back uh, let me see i think it was june 10th uh, on june 10th the uh, when the cpi was released um, and it was hotter than expected the dxy was up 0.85 percent um, on the previous month, I don't remember exactly where it was, but I believe the DXY was green on the CPI print then too. It was a little bit of a different type of print then. Um, but in any case, uh, it, people were wondering why is the DXY down so significantly um, on the CPI? And I, I don't really have the answer, um, but I have been saying for the longest time that um, in the macro backdrop that we currently have, um, the dollar rising makes far more sense than the dollar falling and the trend is up. And so, um, I mean, like you can actually kind of see, uh, if I, let me, let me try to mark this up here. Uh, I'm going to try to do my best. It's not going to be perfect, but you can kind of see this kind of steady channel, um, rising between June of 2021 and then March of this year. And then we've kind of been in a new stage, of the rise here um, and actually that makes a lot of sense if you uh, if you were to um, kind of make that a channel of sorts uh, it makes sense that we've we're hitting kind of the top end here and having some trouble breaking out um, and actually if you uh, let me go out of this for a second and if you put on the sam's indicator um, which uh, is obviously something if you become uh, a subscriber to my premium subscriber to my newsletter, then you will get access to it. But um, on the SAMS indicator, uh, the vol uh, range here, um, is, or the volatility range, I should say, uh, just to be more clear, um, you can see we're kind of, we've been touching near the top end of it. And so it makes sense whenever you look, uh, whenever you see price hitting the top uh, uh, deviation of the vol range, um, then either you get a sideways consolidation as you see here in March um, or you get a, a straight up pullback like in, uh, in the end of January and early February um, and a similar type of thing, which was a little bit delayed, but also happened at the end of April and into May. Um, and so I, uh, I, I want to say like a week or two ago, I was thinking that once we were hitting the top of the range here that we would go sideways. Um, and that made a lot of sense because um, if you if I darken this up so you can see it uh, a little easier, um, I was watching this uh, this sort of um, ascending triangle or ascending wedge, uh, not a triangle, a wedge pattern. Um, and uh, I was looking for on the breakout, um, which was right here on, I believe on July 6th and July 7th, I was looking for price to come back and actually touch it. Uh, and maybe perhaps consolidate above it for a little bit before uh, resuming up. And instead of doing that, uh, price just took right back off. Um, we got a massive 1.23% uh, day to the upside on that. Um, and so um, the dollar strength has continued to be uh, persistent. Um, we obviously had a, this... I don't know if you would call this an engulfing candle if you're going just by the body of the candle it is um, but we have had a pretty significant down day today um, but of course it's dwarfed by all of the really big up days that we've had um, 
in the bull markets here or in the in markets that are appreciating everyone spends their time looking for tops and i'm just over the last uh over the last year if you think about it uh, people looked for tops here um people looked for price to roll over right about here because that's about where we topped uh in april of 2021 um, so right here is where everybody, including myself, was expecting it to roll over. Um, and as we came down and made a higher high right here, this is when I became a dollar bull um, back in October of last year. Um, and there have been so many times in the last, even if we just want to use since I turned into a dollar bull, uh, where people were calling top, people called top here, people called top here, people called top here. People called top here and here. People called top here, and and I'm just I'm saying people calling top because I was, uh, you know, on my particular Twitter feed the sentiment was the dollar is probably going to top here. The dollar can't possibly continue, um, and the lesson here is you just have to let price tell you what's going on. And um, I wanted to have, take a different look at the DXY um, by looking at each of its components. Um, so the DXY basket is fifty. Uh, I think 53 or 55 percent euro. Then the next highest percent is the Japanese yen, and then um, I believe less than 10 percent um, is in the uh, against the British pound, and then even less so against the Canadian dollar. And then the two lowest are the Swedish krona and the Swiss franc. A lot of people don't know the Swedish krona is in the um, dollar index basket, but it is uh, interestingly enough. Um, and uh, what I did was I went back to write about uh, the Monday that, um, which mo the Monday that we were, uh, which is following my last weekly update um, was uh, an off day for Juneteenth, um, but uh, the currency markets were still trading in spite of that. And, um, and so uh, what we, what I've done here is I've, I have the DXY components up for the last a uh, few weeks going back to when I last gave a weekly update. Um, and as you can see, based on the current price lines, um, if you go from, if you look at kind of the left side where the dotted line touches the furthest leftmost part, you can see that only really the Canadian dollar um, is at the same level. I mean, it's basically at the exact same level it was when I last gave a weekly update. Um, and then the next closest is the Swiss franc. Uh, which is pretty close, um, but not quite there. Um, everything else has significantly appreciated, obviously led by the Japanese yen and the euro. Um, the euro actually, if uh, if I come back here and let's see if we just go euro USD um, and we take a look at this, we actually see that the euro went sub uh, parity, um, which I won't be able to get this exact, but right about here, um, you see that we wicked down below, um, and we're we're bouncing right now. Um, this is obviously a uh, multi-decade low. I think I even have to, I have to go to a weekly chart um, to go find the last time that we were at these levels. So um, the last time we were here uh, was in uh, December of 2002. So almost exactly 20 years ago. Um, and you can see on the weekly chart, this was a consolidation range above a breakout. You can kind of see here, if I just kind of mark this spot, you can see a breakout on a weekly basis consolidation. So um, my guess would be the 96, 97 level would be kind of the next uh, level of support that we would want to watch on the euro. And, and that's a really big deal because if the euro continues to weaken, obviously Europe is going through crisis right now. Um, Germany is having an energy crisis. Um, Italy is way over indebted. They're, they're still kind of in a way easing because they have to protect uh, a lot of the countries in Southern and Eastern Europe, which um, are in really poor financial situations. Um, and so um, that's part of the reason why the euro is suffering and falling the way that it is. Um, but if the euro continues to fall, the DXY is going to continue to appreciate. Um, and uh, and then if the, the, the yen continues to be devalued because the Japanese are protecting their yield curve, then that will also lead, help lead to upside pressure for the DXY. And um, as the DXY rises, um, asset markets have been tending to fall. Um, and so 
Uh, the DXY has been a story. Uh, now, there are a lot of other things going on in the markets. So uh, what I thought I would do is I would pull up uh, the Fred data on the non-farm payrolls because um, this month here in June obviously was a, uh, a pretty big deal. Let me actually go to a year. Let me just do the year chart. Um, so uh, I have right here, this is the, the total employees. So this is basing it on actual you know, numbers of thousands of persons. So obviously you know, a thousand times wherever we're at here, about 152, uh, 151, 980 times a thousand. So um, these are total employees. So obviously uh, pretty strong. Um, the better way to look at it oops, is uh, through the, um, uh, is looking at the rate of change um, on a monthly basis. So this is going back a year. Um, and so as long as these bars are continuing to, be on the upside, then what this is showing you is the number, uh, raw number of people employed versus the previous year. So um, if you kind of go back five years, then you can see sometimes, like especially in April 2020, uh, when we had this really big down uh, move on the chart. Um, typically, uh, the, the best thing is to see these bars be above the zero line. You can see the zero line down here. They're all above zero. Um, and so uh, we're obviously going to get to a point where uh, things are going to level out. Um, and I thought, oh, yeah, I know what I have to do. So sorry. Um, excuse me. Uh, so you can see here in February 2020, uh, which was our last peak, um, we we're actually above where we currently are. So we still, interestingly, have yet to totally return to the level of employment uh, in terms of raw numbers than where we were uh, pre covid um, and obviously you, you start figuring base effects here. Um, when you start like in April, 2020, when you start from such a low number, um, then your base effects ultimately are going to eventually start to peter out. Um, and you're going to kind of level off and that, and then you're going to see, uh, maybe these numbers come down, 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 down closer to that zero line. And, and then the other thing you have to think about is, um, the jobless claims, and so this is looking for the last year, month by on a kind of a, a weekly basis. You can see here. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. This is uh, just for the last uh, six months. Let me let me do the year. Uh, that'll be a little bit better. So you can see that. Um, actually, what's really interesting is in March you saw this uh, bottom out, and since the middle of March we've actually been slowly increasing in the amount of. Uh, uh, jobless claims, weekly jobless claims. Um, th th these are the initial claims. So that means like new people uh, looking for uh, unemployment benefits. Um, and so I think that this is an interesting sign because um, only in the last month or so, and I, I don't have it up, but only in the last month or so, I want to say month to two months, you've seen a lot of really large corporations beginning to announce that their uh, unemployment I'm sorry, not their unemployment, uh, that they're going to, going to announce that they're going to be cutting back uh, or they're going to be hiring less. And so I think that's interesting on the tails of the unemployment jobless claims, the initial claims uh, bottoming and starting to come back up. Um, and so that's really something interesting that I want to be watching because um, as we pay attention uh, to the markets, um, as we think about uh, kind of where things are at um, in the economy, um, the Fed continuing to hike um, as long as the inflation data uh, tells them that they should. And you see here, I've actually got the chart up, uh, the little table of um, the uh, changes in the CPI. Um, and so you actually see the unadjusted. It was it came in at 9.1%. That's right up here if you see where my mouse is in the top right corner. Um, for all items, it's just hilarious. I mean, it's not hilarious, but I mean, just it's it's incredible um the the rate of change if you look here 98.5 percent for fuel oil so your costs in the last year for fuel have gone up like your your just your fuel oil have gone up 100 percent your gasoline of all types uh, that includes more than just your uh your automotive gas but your gasoline is up 60 percent um it's just incredible right and yet Apparently, your your all items, your CPI is nine point one percent. It's insane. So, um, in any case, um, 
you know, that's, that's also something that we have to be watching because the CPI coming down is going to be uh, not just the CPI, but the uh, CPE the, and the core um, numbers for those um, are going to need to come down for the Fed to start uh, kind of, uh, I wouldn't say pivoting, but for them to uh, maybe not tighten quite as much. Um, and that whole thing has been a roller coaster lately. I don't have the data up to show you or the remarks up to show you, but uh, the possibility of 75 basis points or 100 basis point hike um, have been kind of whipsawing in the last 48 hours um, from comments made by Fed officials. And so we've got all of this stuff going on. Um, and, and it begs the question, you know, are we in recession? And um, a lot of people are looking at a lot of the projections um, for Q2, which are coming in suggesting that we will have negative growth, which would mean a technical recession coming in. Um, but where, uh, you know, this uh, payroll situation um, is really kind of the kicker here because uh, the labor market being so hot, um, jobs continuing to be added month by month, um, is part of the reason why, and, and if you remember, um, before COVID, the unemployment uh, was historically low, total number of employees non-farm was historically high, um, and uh, we're coming back up to those levels. So um, Powell has a lot of, and the Fed have a lot of room to um, to tighten because where the real recession is going to begin to show up. And, and a lot of people are looking at um, other numbers. I'm sorry, I'm kind of jumping around here. A lot of people are looking at uh, numbers, uh, production numbers and things like that. And, and that's all true. But one of the last things that's going to have to get really hit um, is going to be the uh, the payrolls, the unemployment. And um, that's going to be something that is going to be lagging so much by the time we're already deep into, I, I would say, by the time we're deep into recession, um, the payrolls is going to be the last thing to really get hammered. Um, and so um, everybody, I feel, and I'm just going to say this here, and I've been recording for some time, and I'm, I'm finally going to get to the punchline here and start looking at some other markets. But um, I think the market is pivoting too early um, to the recession trade. And, um, and I think the reason why is because people, and, and a lot of people have been talking about this. Let me go to the S&P for this illustration. Um, a lot of people are expecting a crisis like this to unfold, where we just get a, this huge crash. Um, everything is going to, you know, bottom. We've got um, kind of this like a, a, a assumption because this recession happened quickly and was over quickly um, because the Fed acted so quickly. Um, I think a lot of people are just assuming that uh, because the technical recession is going to be here, um, that the Fed is just going to pivot and it's going to pivot sooner. And so I feel like what's happening is there's a lot of repositioning. Um, and with the CPI print, a lot of people are already calling this the peak CPI, um, even though people called peak CPI back in March and then again in April. And and those have all kind of been, those predictions have all kind of been washed out. But I just think that the market is repositioning a little too quickly a little too early in my opinion prematurely uh you know before they should be and um and i think what's going to happen is the bounce that we're seeing right now which actually is really interesting if you look at it we haven't made a higher high uh versus the end of june so we've gone two two and a half weeks and we haven't made a higher high um in spite of that uh to me this is a classic oops this is a classic bounce so in my opinion, um, what's going to happen is the market thinks that it's time to get ahead of the Fed pivot, but they're underestimating the resolve of the Fed to beat inflation. I'm not saying the Fed will beat inflation, but the Fed is going to try. And so I think what's going to happen here is, you know, my, just kind of my prediction, I guess, for the next week is that the market will either grind sideways or grind up, perhaps right to this uh, this trend line, um, and then it's just going to get flushed. And what's going to happen then is, and, and I'm not sure on the timing 
aspect of this. So don't hear me wrong as I talk about as I talk about this to think that I'm talking about, you know, that I'm trying to say this is going to happen soon. Because part of part of what I was just talking about, you know, if I can deviate again for a second, is that um, people are expecting this to happen fast. People are obsessed with instant gratification. People don't have patience um, for the market. And, uh, and that's kind of a problem. And so I think that people are expecting this to happen so fast. And because, um, we've had a lot of this news lately, and this is where the markets are rather than down here, I think what's going to happen is over the coming weeks and potentially months, um, we're going to get flushed down. Um, and we're going to, I think we're going to make it down to between 32 and 3,400. That's my prediction. I mean, I think my base case is we make it to, uh, the, the, around this yellow box area in the 3200 range. Um, so I think, and it can happen quick. I mean, think about how quickly this happened. I mean, this is where we get into August and potentially September. Um, but I think we're gonna get, um, like my base case is we're gonna get one more really significant wash down. And I think that we're consolidating here, getting ready to do that. Um, and so uh, I think that that's going to happen. Um, so I think that this bounce is a bounce to sell into, um, if you're shorting, um, or if you still need to get out of your position. And, and the question is how far do you let prices fall before you jump on the shorting bandwagon, um, or before you just sell out of your position? Cause, cause I understand the, the mindset that some people might have is like, oh, wow, we've already drawn down, you know, 20%. If I sell down now, like what's, what are the odds or what's the risk reward of me selling now? Um, and then trying to buy back in at a lower price. What if the market's already bottomed? Um, but I mean, there's a lot of space that can be, you know, I mean, from, from where we close today to my level, it's another 16%, um, 16, 15 to 17%, we'll say. So, um, it could happen. And, um, you know, and that's my base case. And, and for all we know, we could have even further downside, um, but I think that's what's setting up to happen. I think people are getting a little too excited. I've said this a lot on Twitter um, and in my newsletter, people are getting a little too excited about these bounces. Um, and uh, if I were to jump over to the VIX really quick, um, we're still like subdued in volatility. We have not made uh, this this swing low is something I'm watching at 23, uh, around 2380, 2390. Um, we're kind of squeezing into a range here. And to me, that doesn't bode well. Oops. And um, bear markets don't end with the VIX at this level. I think, and this is why I think we're in for kind of one more VIX spike. And I think that within the next, you know, month or two, I think we're going to get squeezed and then we're going to have a VIX spike. And then it's going to slowly come off. And as it comes off, the market, uh, you know, and again, timing wise, I don't know, but. I suspect that the market will bottom right after that VIX spike, um, and then we'll base, and then we'll, you know, start, you know, recovering, and that'll be the bottom. Um, again, don't have the timing on that, but that's kind of what I think is is about to happen. Um, so, having said all that, let's take a quick look at the equity indices. Um, again, I'm watching that uh, that that swing high where this wick uh, is. Um, and I think it's important to to consider to kind of just about that line because that'll mark approximately a higher high. We got rejected there. This is where we kind of um, gathered up for this bounce uh, right up here um, before the May CPI was released. Uh, and so um, I'm watching that line right there um, on the S and P 500. I'm on the Nasdaq. Um, kind of a similar thing, although the the zone doesn't look quite the same. You can see. Um, the uh, green and the yellow boxes are actually kind of providing, um, you know, some really good uh, spots uh, or zones to buy, to sell from. Um, so again, I think that if we get up into this green zone or to the bottom of this green zone, that's going to be a prime selling spot. Um, not sure if we'll make it there, but um, but uh, but we might. Um, the Dow, uh, also an interesting spot. I think that. Um, what I'm watching for is to see if we can sustain price action above on this close and into next week. Can we get above and kind of move up a little bit more? I'm not really sure. Um, the NASDAQ 
has been the one outperforming uh, most recently, and also the S and P. Although today, I think the Nats or the the Dow and the Russell moved up in percentage wise higher, um, so that's something to watch. Um, the Russell uh, similar, um, although I would call this more of a, maybe a sideways uh, triangle consolidation here. I'm going to be watching that spot right there. Um, again, I think that. Uh, at best, the equity markets are bouncing. Um, and I think, in my opinion, the bounce will probably persist or either sideways or slightly up into next week. And then I think, because uh, we just had OPEX too, so that's something to consider. And then we're going to uh, come down. Um, I think the yield situation is really interesting. So really briefly, I want to just go and show you the yield curve is inverted again. Um, and uh, it's very deeply inverted. Let's go on the weekly chart and let's try to find the last time that we were at this level. We're at the, on the yield curve, we're at the low of where the yield curve was in 2006 and in 2007, right before the GFC, right? Um, so that's interesting. Um, and then before that, the low was at um, uh, negative, let's see, negative 4.88%. Um, right before the dot, uh, right around the time the dot com bubble was bursting, um, and then obviously, and this chart doesn't go back far enough, but we're at similar levels from the late '80s, early '90s. So, kind of a big deal, you know. I, I was kind of facetiously joking that the yield curve inverted again, but who really cares? But it actually is kind of a big deal. Um, taking a look at credit spreads really quick. Credit spreads, everyone was uh, looking at, oh, credit spreads retreating, but I mean, they're still on their way up. It's not a good sign. Um, and that six level, a lot of people are watching that six level. Um, uh, so you can see in March, 2020, uh, we jumped up above the six level big time. 2015, 2016, we did. Um, it's crazy if you actually look at this, uh, let me go to a weekly chart, it'll be a lot better. Um, if you look at where we are now versus where the credit spreads could go, if you look at the dot-com bubble, if you look at the GFC, even just the COVID crisis and a couple of the other like brief crises moments that we've had, um, a lot can happen uh, and it can go up really far. And if and if that happens, if the credit markets break, then that's when you're going to get your big washout on uh, in the equity markets. Um, so having said all that, um, the yields, if I zoom back in here on the 10-year, um, they're coming into a pretty important spot. I mean, the trend is still very easily up. If I extended this uh, bottom trend line out, um, we still have a lot of room to fall, and we still would maintain the uh, we, we could still maintain the uptrend. Um, but uh, then I've got a couple of these other dotted trend lines, which are showing more steep uh, price action. Um, so we've got this trend line, which I think is going to hold for a little while. We've got this more parabolic trend line. Um, a lot of people, I mean, if you've paid attention, we've watched all sorts of lines. We've watched this, we've watched this, we've watched this. Um, and so the question is, you know, is it, have we, are we done moving this line or not? And so I just moved it for the sake of, of having it there. Um, and I've also marked a descending trend line to show um, kind of what we need to break out from. Um, we'll see if we get it. Um, we might, we might not. Um, I think this is going to be a really important tell. A lot of people are already watching. Uh, whoops, this, I always do that. Sorry. A lot of people are watching. Uh, going to be watching Head and Shoulders. If we start coming down right about there, people are going to. You're going to see a lot of charts with this line right there, watching Head and Shoulders. Um, and uh, I feel like everyone's always looking for those, so be careful with that. But that totally is something that could be the case. Um, and if that was a head and shoulders, then the target would be probably somewhere, uh, if I could, it's probably somewhere in this range or in this range. Um, so maybe somewhere in that, uh, in that area would be something to watch for. Um, and if yields come off, you're going to see a big move, uh, I think in, uh, in asset risk assets, depending on with a caveat, depending on where everything else is. If we're in the, if we're about to go into crisis mode, um, if we're getting the deflationary crash and spiral, then it's not going to matter if yields come off. Um, everything else will crash too. And I'd, and you know, for Exhibit A of that, let's just consider 
how yields came off in the March cra- uh, the March crisis in 2020, while everything else did too. So just something to keep apprised of. So yields coming off doesn't necessarily guarantee that risk assets are going to move up if everything else is pointing to deflationary crash. So just something to think about and something to be aware of. Um, Quick look at the gold chart. It's ugly. I mean, I've got this green solid line marking where our 2021 lows were. Um, We're getting close to that. It's pretty crazy. This, I definitely, I can't say I expected this, Um, but I, I, I think that gold might be, there are probably the earliest one pricing in def- a deflationary event. Um, not really sure, but something I'm watching. The silver chart looks even worse. Um, we're, we've already given up most of our uh, gains. Um, uh, we gave up the consolidation range. Um, we're at the same level that we were right before the uh, March 2020 crash. Um, so there's that. Um, and then crude oil been watching this a lot everybody's again i think this is i'm not really sure what to make of this i I go back and forth about this but i really think that oil is going to go back up um but i could be wrong maybe we could come down a little bit more um as the market again continues to try to price in the possibility of uh, recession and the likely recession that's coming um but i think it's a big deal um that we uh we wicked down um, below, let me, and actually, let me go to my object tree really quick, um, because I have, I actually had this, this was my original Fibonacci level, because I was going from the wicks, and as soon as we wicked below, uh, this, uh, the, the zero line right here at 93.53, I changed to this Fibonacci, which is going by daily closes, um, uh, and I think it's, uh, helpful because you can see how, um, price retraced uh, back up all the way to the one level um, on a wick basis and then came back down and wicked below uh, the the zero line there which comes in on this chart on this Fibonacci uh, set at 9429 Um, I think that's important that it wicked down below and couldn't close below Um, but I'm definitely watching to see if the uh, momentum to the downside continues um, and that has a lot to do with uh, the, the China zero COVID policy, as well as um, builds in the uh, Cushing, Oklahoma um, oil reserves. Um, but a lot of that is because the um, SPR continues to be drained, um, which I think is stupid, but that's what they're trying to do to score political points. Um, so um, so that's that. Um, but there, I think there's a lot of things going into the decline here. That's why I'm pretty sure that it's going to come back up. And I think it's important, too, to recognize we've given up the entire oil premium once again um, from the Russia-Ukraine uh, war. Um, and so uh, I think that's important. Um, so I'm going to be watching to see if this, uh, this you can see this trend line right here. I'm watching to see if that's going to hold um, and price will continue to consolidate and come down um, or if we're going to get a breakout and a retest and a resumption back to the upside. Um, not really sure, um, but that's what I am watching for. Um, so it's a little bit of a longer video today. Sorry about that, but I appreciate you watching. I um, just wanted to make sure that I caught up on things and I took a look at some data and stuff like that. So um, thank you for watching. I hope you all have a great weekend and I'll be back again next week. See you then.